Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. ¡Wow! Gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Hertel. Okay, one of our favorites, good friend of ours. We love him to death, Daniel DiMartino, one of our great young voices contributors. He is out there fighting authoritative socialism and communism like a beast. I love this guy. Uh, the Dissident Project, something you really need to check into. Daniel, my friend, been a while. Let's talk. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Andrew. All right, sir. Uh, I want to ask you, starting with this, you're, of course, from Venezuela. I This court case, this sob court case down in Miami, it didn't get a whole lot of press, but you tweeted about it. And it's not just the court case that I want to talk about. You talk with the dissident project about the dissidents and the activists and how dissent is crushed and how the propaganda by these dictators works. This court case is a good example of because this is U.S. soil. This is down in Miami. We have this sob case where um, this is an ally of Nicolas Maduro's government. And they're trying him. But what happened in the courtroom and what you tweeted about goes to what you talk about with the Dissonance Project. All these supporters of the Maduro government shows up and they're protesting and they're trying to do a show of force. That's not organic. That's a very old tactic. This is one of those ways that these dictators exert influence, even on American soil that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. And I think it's really important to point it out. And you were tweeting about it. Why don't you tell us what you think about that? Yeah, well, what's going on is that Alex Saab is a businessman who uh, has mo laundered money for the Maduro regime for many years. The United States indicted him on money laundering because that's what he is. And the Maduro regime is arguing that he was on a diplomatic passport after the fact that he was arrested when he was not on a diplomatic passport. He isn't even born in Venezuela. This is a man who is actually Colombian with Lebanese citizenship. Uh, so, so this is not a, a Venezuelan individual. And now, because we have we have him in U.S. custody and there's a trial, they're sending paid people, people who who are involved with them in Miami, to the the trial to to show the, this fake support for for the Venezuelan regime. What I was saying is that if there are people receiving payments from the Maduro regime living in the United States, that's something that the FBI and the U.S. Department of Justice need to know about because that's in violation of U.S. law and sanctions as well. Right. And the sanctions are the important part here, not just because of the trial itself. The reason they have to launder money is because they're trying to get around all the sanctions and this sort of thing. But anytime you have a foreign government exerting influence like that, look, this is in a courtroom like this. This isn't just like on a street corner. This is in something that's an integral part of our criminal justice system. Courthouse, that's a symbol of the U.S. government. This is pretty blatant stuff. And it's the stuff that doesn't trend on Twitter. But it's very much a power move to try to do things like this, isn't it? Well, it is because it shows that the Maduro regime has people inside the United States. And these aren't just naive supporters who who are just, you know, answering a call. Um, th this is a, a well-organized group of, of people who are not just in the U.S., but all over the world. And, and that is financed from Venezuela, from Cuba, from Nicaragua. And if they can do that and show up in a U.S. courtroom, you know, they can do a lot of other things and they can lobby legislatures and they even have, you know, people working in, in the U.S. government. And, and that's what's scary, right? It's kind of like what happened in the Cold War. The Soviet Union had spies here. The, you know, the Cubans had spies here uh, and still do. And now the Venezuelans do as well. This is important. Daniel DiMartino joining us because we know um, the immigration crisis in Venezuela 
is driven by the political situation and the economic situation. It's inarguable. That's what's driving the immigration crisis out of there. The fact that they can reach here, and now it seems like after a few years ago where it looked like it was a little sank, little shaky, the Maduro regime not only looks pretty stable now, but now they're back to exerting influence. They're opening their border with Colombia now, they just announced. Uh, they've been doing some ties with Russia because Russia is desperate for any ally they can get right now. So there's been some of that going on. This is not only a stabilized regime. They're starting to try and do exert some influence again. Is that is that an inaccurate way to look at this? Well, the, you know, the Chavez, the, the former dictator who passed away and, and gave uh, power to Maduro afterwards uh, in 2013, he had a strategy of asymmetrical warfare against the United States. And that came in different forms. So one of one of the his tools against America was the cocaine trafficking, in which he was personally involved with, just like Maduro is and the rest of the Venezuelan regime and military are. That's uh, what the Cartel of the Sons, the El Cartel de los Soles, which is indicted by the Department of Justice, it does. They they send cocaine from Venezuela to the United States in massive numbers. Um so, so that's on one end. The other end is, is um, information warfare. They have channels that are financed by the Venezuelan regime that, and, you know, try to persuade people in the United States. One of them is Telesur. Telesur not only has, um, you know, a, a, a traditional TV channel presence, but a social media presence in Twitter, in YouTube, in, in Instagram, everywhere. And that's where they try to say that anything that happens in Venezuela that's bad, it's because of U.S. imperialism instead of socialism, which is the reality. Uh, and, and then there's the, the more obvious warfare of, uh, you know, criminals uh, and people who come here that they try to send or, or, or criminals that are international and they try to collaborate with Iran and with Russia and Cuba. And all of this, their, their goal ultimately is to take over more countries, to make sure that there are more people on their side, um, more money to steal, that the United States stops sanctioning them. And that's why they do this information warfare to persuade people against the sanctions. And, and ultimately, so that they can stay in power in perpetuity. Yeah, Daniel D. Martina joining us. You just mentioned it. Asymmetric warfare politically with a lot of different motion. What does it tell us, though, that this is warfare that they're fighting? They see this as warfare. They see this as a geopolitical struggle. But the United States policy, and this is bipartisan because it goes back a couple of administrations now since Hugo Chavez. Policy wise, Americans government and the American people don't seem to be treating it as that kind of a problem. How do we bridge that gap of like, look, they're doing this on purpose and we're not even really paying attention to it other than when the immigration stuff pops up on the radar here, there and yonder. How do we start changing that? Because, you know, if you got one person fighting you and you're not even paying attention, that's when you kind of get a lot of harm done just by inertia and by ignorance and by not paying any attention whatsoever to it. Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, I think that the what's happening with Russia and Ukraine is actually a good opportunity to let people know about this because Venezuela isn't the only foreign state that does this against the United States. Russia has been doing it for far longer. And and Russia has Russia today, uh, where they both bring what's the Russian population and the um the American population that, that tunes into those channels. But they also have a bunch of little offshoots that they collaborate with Iran and Venezuela with. Channels like the Gray Zone, uh, which su supposedly say they're independent journalists, but when you look into their legal structure, they are part of Russian and, and other foreign state entities. And they have personally met with the dictators of all these places and, and, and expressed their support. So, you know, the Chinese pay YouTubers to promote their pro-CCP content so that they can brainwash the, the youth in the United States. And it is an opportunity to crack down these things because the reality is that the First Amendment applies to people in the United States. It doesn't apply to foreign states trying to send money into America. And we can and should restrict the use of foreign government money in U.S. media. 
that is not restricting U.S. media. You can say whatever you want in favor of, of Putin, in favor of Maduro, if you're in the United States, if you use your own money, not if you use the money of the Venezuelan regime that comes from human rights violations and, and it's blood money. That's what we should be restricting. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. Yeah, Daniel DiMartino, you talked about this before, but I just want to reiterate it. The scale of this, the numbers don't really, but 7 million refugees out of Venezuela since the Maduro regime. That's a catastrophic number by any measure. About 450 to 500,000, depending on which numbers you want to use. The UN uses 465,000, wound up in the U.S. Obviously, Colombia and Peru and Chile, they get a lot of them just geographically. Spain and Brazil. This is a massive diaspora of Venezuelans that have left the country. Before we talk about the American side of the immigration, just talk about what that does to Venezuela itself, the brain drain, the talent drain, the people that are leaving. There's just no way to really comprehend what that does to a country, is there? Well, the the most shocking part um, on, on really the, the part that Venezuelans feel the most is that now there's so many empty houses and empty buildings in the country. Um, you know, whole neighborhoods that are half full, um, you know, friends and families that are separated. There's virtually no family in the country that doesn't have at least one family member who has left. There are many families that their entire, the entire family has left. And that, that is destructive for, for the social fabric of a, of a region, of a country. And, and it's really sad. Economically, though, I gotta say that the immigration has helped those who has who have stayed, because since there's no way to make money and survive in the country, the fact that seven million out of 30 million people have left and are sending back remittances every month is actually what's maintaining the people who stay behind alive. And so, um, you know, in that way, Venezuela has become similar to Cuba a parasitic economy where they can't produce anything because of the government regime inside, but it's it's dependent on its diaspora abroad to send money back in to survive. Yeah, Daniel Martino joining us. Let's talk about those immigrants in America, though. Just back in October, the U.S. started to change their policy. It had been that Venezuelans were winning their asylum cases at a much higher rate than most of the other people groups that were coming in. Crackdown is not the right word, but they basically said, hey, the Venezuelans at the border are going to be like everybody else. They're going to have to be in line. Then they turn around and say, well, we're going to make these 24,000 slots for them. Well, the problem is there's 33,000 Venezuelans a month trying to come in. Should there be a different policy towards Venezuelans? We just saw here recently in the last week or two that they've extended uh, protection for Haitian refugees. We've had Ukrainian refugees things. We've had, of course, the Afghanistan refugees that we brought over. Should the U.S. policy be different towards Venezuelan refugees coming from this country? And what should it look like? Well, let, let me ex begin by explaining a little bit of what the policy is and, and, and was re with respect to asylum seekers in general in the southern border um, and how Venezuelans used to get asylum before. So because Venezuela used to be a rich country, a lot of Venezuelans had U.S. tourist visas in their passports. And... That meant that when things got rough, a lot of Venezuelans who, who wanted to come seek asylum in America, they just bought a plane ticket, traveled to the States, and once they were here, they claimed asylum. That is a process that happened for over a decade, and nobody even noticed because this was our orderly processed planes. You know, nobody knew it was happening, really. Um, these were people with more means because they had the means to buy a plane ticket. Um, but what happened is that since the 2019, there's no U.S. embassy in Venezuela. Even then, nobody's getting tourist visas to come to the United States because, every, you know, the, the U.S. embassy thinks, I think rightfully, 
that if you're going to get a tourist visa specifically to come to the States right now, you're likely going to want to get asylum and, and overstay. So they just don't give it to you. And what happens is that a lot of Venezuelans just say that the, their only path, uh, realistically, it's true, their only path is to walk to, to the southern border and claim asylum there. Now, since the pandemic, there's been a policy called Title 42, which is really uh, a, a policy to, to deter disease into the United States. And so the U.S. government has been claiming for many years now, for over two, that uh, asylum seekers are bringing COVID-19 into the United States, which is a lie. And that's why the judges have, you know, already overturned Title 42 and have given until this month to the U.S. government to do something else or Title 42 ends regardless because it is not true on public health grounds. You cannot justify, you know, forbidding asylum against U.S. law, by the way, because U.S. law says that if you present yourself at the southern border and a port of entry, you, you, you have the right to seek asylum. Uh, if, if they deny you asylum later because your claim is false, they can deport you. But on, on its face, you have the right to seek asylum and wait inside the country. Um, what happened was that the, the Biden administration was not applying Title 42 to Venezuelans. Uh, in October, they started applying Title 42 to Venezuelans. And in exchange, they gave Venezuelans a, a parole program, which means that you can apply from Venezuela to come to the States if you have a sponsor. The goal, and I think it's a good goal, is to make the process more orderly so that there are no Venezuelans getting shipped to New York in, in buses and end up in homeless shelters, which is bad for, you know, the Venezuelans and it's bad for crime in the city. Uh, and so I, I support that move. The problem is that it was too few spots, as you mentioned, you know, just 24,000, that more than those have applied already. And by the end of the year, it's, they're going to run out. And, um, and anyway, Title 42 is going to end. So what I think that the Biden administration should be doing is how do we make sure we have an orderly asylum process at the southern border and before the border? So can we change the law or can we do something by executive action such that people can apply for asylum online in their home country safely, but at the same time not wait months because they don't have months, you know, because that for a race, there's a reason they seek asylum. They don't have months to stay in their countries. Um, or do we have a, or, or can we change our policies here such that when people get to the southern border, they are left in processing centers, not, not allowed in the rest of the country. And the decisions are quick, you know, less than a week rather than, than a year. Because if the decisions are going to take a year, you cannot keep somebody who has not committed a crime in jail for one year. That's inhumane. Because I know people who have been left in those ICE facilities crossing the southern border for months without committing any crime, just waiting for to be released and without even an asylum decision. And let me tell you, the conditions are not good. They're really dire. The food is terrible. You know, the, the treatment is not right. And, and so we need to make sure that if they're going to stay in any government facility, these people claiming asylum, it needs to be less than a week. And if the decision is negative, they get deported. And if the decision is affirmative, they get admitted with full rights inside the United States. Yeah, Daniel Dean Martino, you do a lot of public speaking, so you've been around the country for quite a bit now. When you're talking to people about Venezuela, is it, oh, I didn't realize that was happening or I didn't realize how bad it was? What's the level of knowledge? What's the response you get when they get that human face in front of them and it's not just a news story or a tweet? Tell me the reaction you get when you're just talking to people about what's going on in Venezuela, the reaction you get to it. Well, they didn't know that, for example, uh, none of the groups they speak to knew that Venezuelans were the largest refugee crisis in the world right now. Because everybody talks about Ukraine and Syria and Afghanistan, uh, yet nobody knows that it is 7 million Venezuelan refugees compared to six and a half and, and so for, for Syria and, and Ukraine each. Um, and, and so... 
you know, people get shocked by that, especially the kids, since I speak at the high schools and middle schools to, to talk about Venezuela and what happened there too. Uh, the kids had no idea about anything happening in Venezuela at all. They didn't know Venezuela was a socialist country. And they didn't know Venezuelans were starving or leaving their country. Um, and, and they were surprised to learn that there is a, another socialist government in the Western Hemisphere aside from Cuba. And so that's why I think that task is so important because Venezuela, unlike Cuba, unlike the USSR, unlike Eastern Europe and China, is the only socialist country who was destroyed by socialism through a democratic election at the beginning. It was some, something that the Venezuelan people elected and they made a mistake. And now we can't get them out democratically, of course, um, you know, even though the Venezuelan people want that. Um, and I think that that's an important story to tell because Venezuela used to be a rich country and it fell because people elected the wrong, uh, the wrong platform, the wrong ideology into power. And, and that's something that could happen to the United States. Yeah, Daniel DiMartino. Let's talk about the United States real quick, though. I look, immigration's a mess in the U.S. You just walk through it. That's just the Venezuelans. You've got all these other people groups that's got similar situations, good, bad, or indifferent. The immigration situation's bad. We don't want to deal with it in a comprehensive manner. We want to keep piecemealing it. There's political things. There's economic things. It's bad. But turning that noise down. When you just have to deal with some idiot online, like, well, deporting because they didn't like something you say. When you deal with crap like that, how do we change this conversation online? And I don't mean the people that are just bad faith and just throwing things out because there, there's a long strand of anti-immigration in America. You can go look at political cartoons from the 1800s. This is not new. How do we talk about this better? We, ourselves, social media in person? Is it putting human faces on it? Is it talking about the legal and the ramifications and the regulations that can be changed and should be changed? Is it talking about the economic side of it? Is it some combination of it? How do we talk about this better? Because right now it's just something we throw at each other online and that's not getting anything accomplished. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer that personal interactions and putting a face to people uh, is very impactful. And it's very different to talk about something in the abstract than to talk about your friend or talk about your family member who you know very intimately how the immigration process was for them and, and what it's really like. And the problem that we have on immigration in this country is that, you know, 80% of Americans have no idea how the legal immigration system works. And most people think that there is simply an application process that any reasonably good and normal skilled person uh, with some type of tie to the United States can, can come legally go through and, and come here. And that's not true. And so, uh, you know, but, but a lot of people understand that it's broken. They just don't know how to fix it. And and that's that's what we need to to make sure people know, and and then and then we can start a conversation over how to do it. Um, there's a lot of uh, evidence in the economics literature that shows that the longer you have interacted with immigrants, the more accepting you become of immigrants. So the the continuous interaction in your communities, you know, a community that has no immigrants has no idea how immigrants are and tends to actually be more opposed to immigration. But communities that have had uh, a, you know, a number of immigrants, it doesn't have to be a high number, maybe 10% of them, maybe 5% of them are immigrants uh, for a long period of time, uh, tend to be more accepting of immigrants. And so if, if we make sure that other immigrants make sure that they befriend more people who are from the United States, if we make sure that you know, that those kinds of relationships keep being built. I, I'm, I'm confident that over the long term, uh, you know, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, the United States, which is already an extremely tolerant and accepting country, um, would become even more so of immigrants. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. 
sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Maine. Church and Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutan. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcast or at www.thesweatypenguin.com. And we know that uh, economically and the strength of our country, look, you either have to have a high birth rate or you got to have immigrants. Like that's just, it's just a math problem. If you want to be an economic power, that's what you need. And we're fortunate where we still, even with all our problems, are a, a beacon of freedom. And a lot of people around the world want to come here and make their lives here in America. And we, we should find a good path to get the best people possible and get the most freedom and economic opportunity for as much people as possible. But that's a longer conversation for another day, my friend, Daniel Martino. You're so good on this stuff and I so appreciate you, but the work you do with going to the schools and the meetings and the organizations you talk to with the Dissident Project, that's probably more important than talking to me. Talk about that for just a second. Let people know where they can find that and the other things you're working on until we get you back on Hertel again, my friend. Yes. So the Dissident Project is the only speakers bureau in the United States who sends immigrants who lived in authoritarian countries into high schools, into middle schools to tell their stories about how these socialists and other forms of authoritarian regimes, uh, you know, made them flee their their country, ruined their 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 lives and their families' lives, and and so that we can create gratitude among the young American students for living in America, and not only make them grateful to live in America, but also allow them to understand that free enterprise is what made America prosperous and 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 so great to live in, um, and. And, and so we, we do this by, by traveling to high schools at no cost. Uh, we have right now five speakers from uh, four different countries. We're going to expand in February to about 15 speakers. So we're on a triple our size because of the high demand that we have from schools. And, and uh, it's truly an amazing experience for the kids that you can find us at dissidentproject.org and you can support us either by donating or by recommending a speaker. If you want to apply yourself, if you are from an authoritarian country and live in the States, or if you're a teacher, you're a staff member, um, you, you can invite us to your school. It has no cost to you. We'll, we'll just find a mutually agreeable date and speaker and we'll make it happen. Yeah, Daniel DiMartino. The thing about that, too, is when you're and I've talked to several of those dissident, somebody like Francis, who's like, hey, when I was your age, I was in the streets of Hong Kong having to protest. That really drives stuff home in a way that just talking about it or seeing a video or whatever. When you talk to those kids, you can see it in their face, right? Like it just hits different when it's somebody close to their age telling them these stories, right? It does. And, and for me, it was when I was 17, is that I left Venezuela, right? And I was... <laughs> you know, living through hyperinflation at the age of these kids. And, uh, you know, I came yesterday from Wichita where I was speaking at a middle school and I was showing the kids, uh, 
you know, cash from Venezuela, and they were uh, very curious about it. And, and when they were seeing the the videos from Venezuela, they were all very curious and came to me to ask to ask me a lot of questions. And 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 you see that it has an impact. You know, in person interaction is more meaningful. A talk is is relatively cheap, and you can impact hundreds of students in each of them. Um, and and the goal is such that. These are young students before they go through what I believe is the college brainwashing machine. And the next time in the in five years when they hear the word socialism for the first time from a politician, what they're gonna think about is not free stuff. They're gonna think about the Venezuelan guy who came to their high school a few years ago and told them how socialism ruined his life or the uh, North Korean girl who told them the same. And, and that's the goal. Yeah, and it's a very good work. Um, Daniel DiMartino, let folks know everything. Follow you on social media and what you got coming up before we let you go. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Daniel DiMartino. Daniel is the regular name, and DiMartino is D I M A R T I N O. And you can also find my find my my work and, and subscribe to to my content on my website at DanielDiMartino.com. Yeah, you do great work, my friend. We will have you back frequently as often as I can get you. Look forward to seeing you soon. Daniel DiMartino, thank you so much for the time, sir. Likewise, Andrew. Yes, sir. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en electrónicos, hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio.